It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. You know, artificial intelligence is, it's connected to so many other things that are going on today. And because it's like we're seeing a convergence. So you've got, you know, not only the amount of knowledge that's being developed and the amount of data and the computer systems and, uh, you know, into quantum computing, which is you know, connected to AI. Um, but you also have science being developed in all sorts of different areas and we have all of this sort of converging and changing our lives and it's all in pursuit of how do we create this demon thing. I think in everybody who are very well versed in these very much high levels of quantum computing, artificial intelligence, interdimensional thinking, quantum physics, they are quite familiar with the understanding that this, this demon aspect is not just an allegory because a lot of these people are initiated into the mysteries and science is sort of that outward mask like that theater mask or that a crazy clown demon mask look right because it's what's underneath is who they are and what they really believe and i don't think most people understand that when we talk about ai we need to talk about quantum mechanics because people are thinking that quantum mechanics is going to do a certain amount of things to bring about the end time and to, to push uh, into further science and things. And the sort of common thought is, is they need AI to partner with quantum mechanics and quantum computing, which they're starting to do, to complete it. And so they need to marry the two, which has a very interesting sort of connotation and understanding when you get to it. And if you think about where all of this sort of begins is, is because artificial intelligence goes deeper than just what we can see. It's going to get into the quantum sort of world. It's going to get into nanotechnology. It's going to get into the atmosphere, you know, the whole aspect of, of quantum ideology. And if we understand that quantum mechanics has been working for you know being put together for the last hundred years or so um, and it's sort of like stepchild coming out of that and or sister is Sophia or the artificial intelligence then you won't be surprised to learn that you know Wolfgang Pauli who uh, was is considered the sort of pioneer of quantum mechanics he was deeply into the occult, which is what I was referring to. And this is not uncommon. Um, he's, he's an individual that was into alchemy and a, a, a fan of Carl Jung and totally into Eastern religions and totally believe that if you want to understand this whole concept of artificial intelligence and quantum mechanics and quantum uh, Computing as sort of descends out of that you have to understand Eastern mysticism um, And then as that sort of progresses you get pioneers like uh, Niels Bohr and uh, Werner Heisenberg and both of them consulted the Vedas for better understanding and, and, and in fact 
Um, they thought that their experiments were co completely consistent with uh, teachings out of the Vedas. And what they would say is, is that there's a unity, and I'm going to read this, there's a unity and a continuity of the Vedanta um, that is reflected in the unity and the continuity of wave mechanics. So they're basically saying they're talking and are kind of one of the same thing. And, you know, you know, Heisenberg, you know, he thought that quantum theory makes sense to people who read the Vedanta and consider Vedic thought. And that's exactly what he's referring to when he talks about that. And then as they get into this understanding of waves and particles, um, that's where you start to get into this whole understanding of, of, of the quantum world. And the idea of quantum entanglement is an idea that comes from their idea of, of knowledge and the knowledge of the universe, that that is held at the quantum level. And you've heard that term come out of CERN, but this is a little bit different. And that's why there's a lot of dispute as to what the God particle is and whether or not they're actually trying to get, you know, what happened at the point of, of the Big Bang of the start of the universe, as science would call it. But what they're searching for is something called the Atma, A-T-M-A or A-T-H-M-A-N, uh, no, A-T-M-A-N. And this is a invisible particle particle and it doesn't merge with all of the other particles but it sort of manipulates the particles in and this is typical Veda thought and so what it is is that it is the soul and the consciousness and the communicator of the instructions and the information and the decisions to all the particles, particles in the universe and quantum entanglement that goes out instantly. And it works through the particles it, like it avatars particle, which again is that Eastern Vedic sort of thought. And it is the true life force. And it is the undiscovered particle because they don't even know how to find it, but that's what they're kind of searching for as they get down to it. And it has different properties than other particles and this is what is holding the knowledge of the universe and communicates it everywhere, which they'd love to be able to tap into. So, so if you want artificial intelligence that is going to go to a level beyond just being self-aware, it has to be able to tap into something that's limitless, right? Because it's going to be forever learning. So obviously, if you're going to um, want to expand quantum computing, you have to have it work in a manner that is more than just single task sort of purpose. Like it can do a ton of things, but single purpose, right? And it doesn't really do anything with that other than give you data and information. So when you hear about artificial intelligence being married up with CERN or with Google, uh, where there, and there's not that many of these very, very advanced quantum computers in the world, but wherever they're doing it, they're trying to match AI in there so that it can expand its ability than single source sort of inquiries, right? So it wants to be able to go into different dimensions, do things faster than anything that's ever been done before, but in a way that can do something with that information coming out and develop it. So that's where it's they want it to partner with AI. But you also want AI in the interdimension aspect if you're going to develop um, more than a self-aware individual. And I don't think it's just knowledge that makes you self-aware, but certainly this ability to become self-aware with intelligence and to be able to create things in terms of mentally and, and, and produce things out of nowhere like humans can or at least out of the imaginations or at least how we think we can do that. Um, let's at least put it that way because I know some people will believe that we don't have any original thoughts and we don't create anything, but that's, that's fine. Um, but if you want to raise that to a level of godhood, 
to a level of technology that they had before the flood to a level that could bring you to the point of rebelling against the omnipotent god of everything you need access to this information in a self-aware manner that can work in multiple dimensions so whether or not you are channeling a spirit or this other type of creation will channel a spirit in this case a demon is it then really getting into the occult thought process of this knowledge of everything that's the atman particle or is it really just trying to find another way to communicate and be led and manipulated by demon spirits right and as we go back using the greek understanding of it this would go back to what they call hero worship so after the hero titan nephilim died they would be afraid of this hero spirit and would come back to haunt its um place of authority that it ruled from and so the people used to do sacrifices and rituals to appease this god who had just lost his physical body because his body died but it's an immortal spirit that's not permitted to go to sleep and it's not permitted to go to heaven and it has enmity for human kind so you can imagine how upset it is and that's why people have to worship them in the greek times and we understand that as those again those those strange kind of gods not the goat gods but the evil spirits where uh some of the idols were made for in the old testament and as the same as those devils or those evil spirits that Jesus was referring to in the new testament that thirst for a body right because they need a body to interact with this world otherwise they're just kind of a nowhere land and Jesus actually calls it as thirsting for a body so they are desperate to have a body all of the time I believe they've made some contact with these these things not only through rituals but through possibly some other experiments that they have the ability to manipulate just like they might have the ability to manipulate an Ouija board for example science stems out of the occult so if you go back to the formation of modern science in about 1660 to 1662 some will date back even to the 1640s with the formation of the royal society this is a group that is formed by the rosicrucians and the freemasons right and they're going to develop the seven sacred sciences which are the same sciences that were um developed by Enoch son of Cain and his progeny of the of the Cain line to a level that took the uh antediluvian world into the first apocalypse by water and so science pays tribute to the royal society even to this day and the royal society is still guiding everything and what they're trying to do is develop the sciences to bring about the end time they're trying to develop the technology to bring about the end time they're trying to honor their pantheon of gods and dishonor the god of the bible and not give god credit for anything and to slander god and so that they can bring about this rendezvous with destiny in the end time so everything is absolutely linked between science and polytheism and people get confused because well they say well the seculars believe in evolution that's pablum for the for the masses that's all that's designed to do is temporarily lead people away from god and prepare them to accept the other ideas afterwards they'll discard that very very soon i think because you know the higher level of scientists and that what's behind in guiding steins then you understand that they actually called themselves as they formed the royal society is the last of the sorcerers and the first of the scientists and that's that transition as they take on that new mask in, in into modern time so they are going to honor their pantheon with their inventions and their advancements and everything that they call whether or not it's the apollo rockets that's going to the moon you can do, may name an endless list of this iconology that's used in science that's there for a reason it's their belief system All right, so 
I'm going to do a bit of a show and tell video today. It's just have a few different things that some people sent me, and they all happen to kind of form a unified theme in a way, so I'm just going to kind of read them all together here, and, and you can do with it as you will. Uh, the first one somebody sent me was from, this is ob obviously from some Kabbalistic website, Living Wisdom, and the title of the article is called "Land is The Land is a Ball, <laughs> Master Kabbalists in Their Writings. Prior to Christopher Columbus's famous voyage across the Atlantic, most people thought the world was flat, with a visible edge that one could fall off of into oblivion. Most people thought this, but not all. English Zohar Fayikra, volume 14, verse 141. Rav Hamnuna Saba, the elder, explains further in his book that the entire inhabited land rolls around like a ball, so that some are up and some are down. To wit, the creatures around the globe are opposite each other, and the seven sections of the globe are seven lands, the seven continents. All of the creatures, all of the six lands, are different in their appearance according to the difference in the atmosphere in each place, and they live like any other man. That's right, the Zohar, written over 2,000 years ago, is clearly stating that the world is a globe, and therefore round. It also happens to mention that there are seven continents, of which six are inhabited. Let us continue. English Zohar Vayikra, volume 14, verse 142. There is an inhabited place, so that when there is light on some, on that side of the globe, it is dark for others on the other side of that world. Thus, when it is day for one group, it is night for the other. There is an inhabited place where there is day only and no night, save only for a little while. Antarctica. Here the Zohar is demonstrating the grasp of the concept of the earth spinning on an axis and revolving around the sun. This was not widely accepted or understood until the 16th century, only, only some 1500 years later. So this obviously is interesting because, I mean, if we had verses like these in the Bible, then obviously there would, I mean, would there even really be able to be any debate over, you know, whether the Bible teaches that the earth is a globe in space? I mean, this is pretty dang explicit. Yet nothing like this exists in the real scriptures, and yet in the Zohar, the Zohar is where you find it. Hmm, food for thought. Again, it always comes back to the Kabbalah. Uh, so, speaking of the Kabbalah, Another friend sent me this. This is a portion from a book on experiencing nature. The Geometrical Kabbalahs of John Dee and Johannes Kepler. The Hebrew Tradition and the Mathematical Study of Nature. So not only does the Kabbalah teach the, explicitly that there's a globe and that you can be standing on opposite sides of it and seven continents and all that. Just the idea of mathematical abstraction as well as connecting this to... Neoplatonism. So this is an interesting excerpt. I'm just going to read like these two pages here. The Geometrical Kabbalahs of John Dee and Johannes Kepler, The Hebrew Tradition and the Mathematical Study of Nature by My Michael T. Walton and Phyllis Walton. Renaissance Neoplatonism was marked by a preoccupation with restoring ancient wisdom as a foundation for present and future knowledge. Although its adherents often had divergent and idiosyncratic agendas, there was a consistent emphasis on developing a Christian worldview grounded in knowledge of the harmony of God's creation, which itself is something that I've, you have to ask, is that something that God even asks us to do? But never mind. The Renaissance Neoplatonic synthesis of Christianity and ancient philosophy was significantly reinforced by the discovery of the Kabbalah, the Jewish esoteric tradition. The Kabbalah taught a descending order of creation from the perfection of God to the imperfect material world. The letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are also numbers, were the basic units of creation. The notions of creation by descent and numerical harmonies indicated similarities between the Kabbalah and the ideas of Pythagoras and of Plato. The correspondences were believed to demonstrate that both traditions shared a common origin, i.e. divine revelation to Adam, Abraham, or Moses. Renaissance Christians, like Pico di Morandola, Johannes Rucklin, and Franciscus Georges, looked to the Jewish mystical tradition in their attempts to rediscover the wisdom behind the Hebrew scriptures. They also viewed the Kabbalah as a sacred original from which the pagan philosophers derived their knowledge. 
Numerous studies have established the importance of Neoplatonism and the Christian Neoplatonic Kabbalah to the intellectual life of the 16th century. The lasting effects of this worldview on European thought, however, are much less clearly understood. One area in which the Neoplatonic Kabbalistic philosophy can be shown to have shaped future thought is in helping to establish the idea that mathematical abstraction is descriptive of nature. How easily Neoplatonism could be connected to Hebrew Kabbalah is seen in the similarity between the ideas of the 6th century philosopher Bothius and the fundamental Kabbalistic text of Sefer Yetzirah. Both were popular sources for 16th century Neoplatonism. Bothius taught that, quote, all things do appear to be formed by the reason of numbers, for this was the principal example or pattern in the mind of the Creator, unquote. This belief was supported by Sefer Yetzirah, or Book of Formation. Yetzirah declared that God created the world through three aspects of the verb to number. He created his word cosmos through three numberings by writing, sifir, number so far, and telling, sipper. For Renaissance Neoplatonists, the view that number underlies all creation was axiomatic. The success of 16th century mathematicians in showing correspondences between observable phenomena and mathematical abstractions, such as geometrical figures, was proof that number is the basis of the natural world. This served to establish mathematics as an indispensable tool for reading the quote book of nature, God's second great scripture. Mathematics thus became an integral part of natural philosophy, not only for Renaissance Neoplatonists, but also for succeeding generations. How the Neoplatonic Kabbalistic tradition helped to routinize mathematics into the study of nature is illustrated by an analysis of the sources for and the impact of the, quote, geometrical Kabbalas of John Dee and Johannes Kepler. John Dee, English magus mathematician, focused the general elements of Neoplatonism into his area of special interest, the relationship of mathematics to nature. He was enormously well-read and wrote on a wide variety of topics. Two of his works, however, the Monus Hieroglyphia, Hieroglyphica and the, quote, mathematical preface are crucial to understanding the role played by the Neoplatonic Kabbalistic philosophy in his mathematics. Anyways, so yeah, so, so, uh, fortunately that's all I have to read. It seems like you have to, I don't know why this book is so expensive. 139 US dollars for an ebook? Does that make any sense? I don't know. So, there's a little clip. I'll leave this link, but, um, yeah, John Dean Kepler. I'm curious what else it had to say. Anyways. So finally, from The New Scientist, somebody also sent me this article, which is, The New Scientist is, yeah, now we're, we're definitely talking about a publication that is more into the, uh, the esoteric. So this one's called, Why Two Geniuses Delved Into the Occult, by Amanda Gifter. In his latest book, Deciphering the Cosmic Number, historian of science Arthur Miller investigates the bizarre friendship between quantum physics pioneer Wolfgang Pauli and famed psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Together, the two great thinkers delved into mysticism, numerology, and alchemy in their quest to understand the universe and themselves. Miller tells new scientists about his experience writing the book. What drew you to write about the relationship between Jung and Pauli? As a physicist, I was, of course, aware of Pauli's scientific achievements. Meanwhile, my interest in creative thinking had led me to Jung. Almost by accident in the 1980s, I spotted on a library shelf a book they co-authored, The Interpretation of Nature and the Psyche. This really intrigued me. What did the apparently austere Pauli have to do with Jung, who routinely delved into the occult and whose reputation sometimes suffered for it? Their book is actually made up of two essays. Jung's is on synchronicity. Nothing unexpected there. But Pauli's was a real eye-opener. He wrote on Johannes Kepler and explored how his scientific achievements had to be understood within the times in which he lived. This involved looking into alchemy, mysticism, and religion. Amazingly, he included his own research into this area. This dazzled me. I had never imagined him to be an expert on such esoteric material and so passionate about it. I had to know more about both of them. What was their connection? Who was the real Wolfgang Pauli? What was the most interesting thing you discovered? I was amazed that each considered the other's work to be of equal importance. For Jung, quantum physics, and for Pauli, Jung's analytic psychology, with its emphasis on alchemical symbols, numbers, and myths, as well as Eastern religion and philosophy. The two sat for hours on end in Jung's gothic-like mansion on the shores of Lake Zurich, dining on fine foods, drinking vintage wine, and smoking the finest cigars, while discussing topics from physics and whether there is a cosmic number at the root of the universe. Ties right into what we were just reading before, doesn't it? 
happening goes back to Kabbalah, John Dee. Uh, to psychology, ESP, UFOs, Armageddon, Jesus, Yahweh, and Polly's dreams. Theirs was a journey into the mind. As Jung put it, with Polly he could enter, quote, the no man's land between physics and the psychology of the unconscious, the most fascinating yet the darkest hunting ground of our times, unquote. Wow. Why were two such great scientists drawn to these occult ideas? Even as a boy, Jung found himself drawn to the occult. This would become the root of his break with Freud. Unlike Freud, Jung was interested in aspects of the unconscious that could not be attributed to an individual's personal development but derived from a deeper, non-personal realms common to humankind, the collective unconscious, whose contents he called, quote, archetypes. Jung came to realize that understanding the collective unconscious involved using images and symbols from alchemy and myth. So you guys understand, right, that when he talks about the collective unconscious, that's just a different name and a different conception of, he's talking about the spiritual realm. And when he says archetypes, those are the entities in that spiritual realm. But so from the quote-unquote psychology, he's putting a psychology spin on it so that it's all in your mind. The collective unconscious, so we, we each have our individual unconscious, but we're all tapped in together somehow. So he's just taking ancient occultism, ancient concepts, and then just like with science fiction and so many other things where you just kind of, you relabel everything and oh it's it's new and it's not new it's just the same old thing with a different hat and that's all young was doing he had a spirit guide and everything okay <clears throat> as a graduate student Polly became interested in the 17th century scientist and mystic johannes kepler reading kepler convinced him that finding universal laws of nature required going beyond science as it is ordinarily defined Polly turned to Jung for help in response to a life-threatening crisis in 1932. Psychoanalysis with Jung led him to believe that alchemy and mysticism were the means to open up his mind, to increase his creativity and understand what drove him. Jung showed Polly that the symbols from alchemy were the key to why he had experienced so much angst in discovering the exclusion principle in 1924, and why this angst had to do with his neurosis. Throughout the rest of his life, Polly saw his research through the lens of Jung's analytic psychology, i.e., occult belief systems. This was the case in his work towards CPT symmetry on parity violation and his final crusade with Heisenberg towards a unified th field theory of elementary particles. Wow, there we go again. Definitely gonna have to look more into this poly guy. Was there any merit in these ideas? I believe so, yes. Even though such ideas through such ideas, they developed an avenue to begin to understand that elusive thing called consciousness. Each believed that their own subjects in isolation lacked the tools and ideas to do this. To Pauli, quantum physics was restricted to examining the attributes of atoms as explainable by mathematics. In this, atoms are treated as dead matter. But how do the atoms and molecules that make us up combine to give us the ability to contemplate love, hate, death, and the universe? To Jung, on the other hand, psychology lacked the concepts to deal with phenomena such as synchronism, that is, meaningful coincidences. Although the two men never came up with answers, the questions they raised, the level of their discussions and their quest to fold physics and psychology together merit further consideration. That was one of the reasons I wrote this book. What did they each gain from their relationship? They gained confidence that their struggle towards an interdisciplinary explanation of the mind was worthwhile. Polly became more than an au courant with young psychology, myths, Eastern religions, and philosophy. Under Polly's tutelage, Jung became somewhat conversant with basic ideas of quantum physics. Both were entranced by Niels Bohr's notion of complementarity, which asserts a reconciliation of opposites, such as wave and particle, in a framework not unlike that of yin and yang. Wow. By the way, yeah, Niels Bohr, he has a yin and yang on, his, on the wall of his, like, of the Niels Bohr Institute, this, that Order of the Elephant thing. Let's see if I can dig that up. Yeah, so he was, he was a mystic too. Jung learned that a basic principle of alchemy, reconciliation of opposites into a unity, pervades quantum physics too. And they each gained a friend and profitable insight into a very different way of thinking about the universe. A very old way of thinking about the universe. So yeah, crazy how these th three things kind of all tie in together and man just underscores all the the same line of direction so thanks to everyone who sent me stuff and uh keep on sending your emails and sending me articles and links and all the fun stuff i 
I can't get to them all, obviously, but I try and kind of pick the ones that pique my interest and hopefully will spark other people to continue to uh, research all these things more so that you can... Sh the whole point is so that you can show people that when we say, look, this stuff did not actually come from a biblical worldview. I mean, when you look into the Renaissance, when you look into Neoplatonism, when you look into... Uh, yeah, the effects of uh, Hermeticism and Kabbalah and alchemy, uh, that it just riddles all this stuff, all the way from, I mean, Neoplatonism goes all the way back to, to Augustine, right? But um, it's just been kind of, I kind of look at it as Neoplatonism as that one kind of philosophical gateway drug that the, the church at large or Christianity at large was never able to really shake off. And eventually, because as that second thing I was reading with the Neoplaton, you know, Plato, Neoplatonism, just Greek philosophy in general. I mean, it's, it's when you really boil it down, it is, it has way more in common with Kabbalah and mysticism and the occult than it does with the Bible. But of course, all these guys, all these scholars were just so enamored with, with, with the Greeks and uh, Plato and, and all this stuff that they just, they had to try and, they couldn't help themselves. So they had to try and synthesize it. They had to try and usurp it for for God, and then yet eventually, you know, had this, you know, a little bit of yeast works through the whole dough, and that's is exactly what happened, and, and you see all these these steps and these stages where all this idea of like, oh, quantifying the universe, quantifying creation, and, and using that to, there's an underlying language. I mean, you hear people today like Jason Lyle, he's, he's completely bought into this idea that math and numbers is the language of God, and it's permeated. So yeah, you, you treat the creation as this quote-unquote book of nature, even though the Bible the Bible doesn't ever talk about there being a second book. I mean, it in some ways, it's kind of like a, it's like a weird version of kind of like with with what Mormonism attests to. Like there was a second revelation of the gospel, right? It wasn't enough just to have the the Bible. There needed to be the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and all that. But you know, we we totally denounce that. But then we turn around and we affirm these ideas. So, oh, the Book of Nature and natural philosophy, and it was just a another Trojan horse, another uh, another gateway drug. I don't know, I'm running out of good analogies, but you hear what I'm saying, so. Anyways, thanks for sending me this stuff.